Join us as we dive into the history, hauntings, and high strangers of the world to try to better understand the paranormal. I will be your guide. I am paranormal researcher and investigator Eric Freeman Sims. Welcome to the Unseen Paranormal Podcast. Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. Today we're chatting with paranormal investigator, author, researcher, and owner of the infamous Hinsdale House, Daniel Class. Daniel is a lifelong paranormal experiencer and investigator. His paranormal studies have taken him across 50 states along with hundreds of speaking engagements. He's the executive in charge of Death Walker with Nick Groff and has made television appearances on Paranormal Lockdown, Paranormal Night Shift, My Paranormal Nightmare, and is a cast member and executive producer of The Ghost Finders. Daniel's book, Hinsdale House and American Haunting, is available on Amazon and Kindle. Ghost Finders is available on Paraflix, Prime Video, Apple TV, and the Roku Spirit Channel. You can find more information on Daniel Class at danielclass.com and on the social medias. Hey, Daniel, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me, man. It's good to be here. Yeah, yeah. I, I love talking about individual locations, and, and you own the, Hins- the infamous Hinsdale House in New York, but I like to dive into the history and the hauntings of, of individual places. And also, you've done lots of other things, too. Like I said, you work with Nick Groff, and you've been on Paranormal Lockdown, a lot of these other shows with the house, and, and also have done plenty of your own shows and documentaries. So how did you first get into the paranormal and, and investigating and, and experiencing the paranormal? I mean, it, it all started for me when I was young, uh, living in a location uh, in, in our family home. You know, we were having weird things happening there and always curious growing up uh, as to why things were happening. Uh, you know, there's only so many times that your your parents can say that somebody's pulling a prank on you that you start to believe otherwise, you know. Um, but we had things happening in our house, uh, you know, like, my sister had her dolls moved all the time when we weren't there. We we had gone to church one Sunday, went out for breakfast, and came home, and there were crayon drawings on our, our ceiling and crayons sitting in the middle of the living room floor. You know, things like that happening all the time there. I had left and gone to college, and then um, ended up, my parents told me they were selling the house, and I thought, oh, it'd be cool to have my, my kids grow up in the same neighborhood. I know all the neighbors, same school I went to, and I thought it was just a really good idea. and. Um, I bought the house and then my son started having some of the same things happening that I had. You know, he started mentioning some of the things, it's all coming back to me now. And I had uh, gone to uh, Lilydale, which is a spiritual community here in Western New York, and sat down with a, um, a psychic medium. And she had, before I even paid her, told me I had two children's spirits in my house. I started researching it more because uh, I had the deed and found out that there were two children that had died in the house, of cystic, died of cystic fibrosis, but I had no idea what they were, they were attached to. She said they were attached to something that was original to them. I ended up eventually finding a painting in the, in the attic. Uh, that, you know, the attic, one of those crawl space things that you never go into, and it was a picture of a little boy and a little girl playing with their dog. And I felt like once I found that, it was able to communicate that to them. It was like a, a weight was lifted, and they were able to cross over. And ever since then, I, I just kind of was on my own path, um, you know, doing the typical ghost tours and just learning history on places and just becoming my own as far as the uh, investigator goes and uh, formed a team in Buffalo. You know, I've been going for year, for over 10 years now. Maybe it's probably longer than that if you, if you count back to when I was a kid. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, professionally, professionally, it's been well over 10 years I've been doing this. Yeah, that's I've I've been doing this since I was a teenager as well. Kind of got into investigating and before the TV shows and all that, going to out to graveyards and sneaking into some places we shouldn't have, you know, with my friends. Uh, oh yeah, I've been there too. <laughs> yeah, trying to figure out you know the paranormal. Don't want to indict ourselves at this point, right? <laughs> right. I think the statute of limitations is over by now. <laughs> but yeah, I, I mean, I consider myself pretty much a lifelong investigator because I've always been curious about the stuff and. And I've said a few times here on the show, I was that weird kid who, whenever the, like the book fair would come to town, I was looking for like the alien books and the ghost books and things. Yeah. But that's interesting to grow up in, in a, in a haunted house. And then also to go back and buy it and kind of your, your, your kids having the same experiences. Although I'm sure that was scary as a parent because you don't, you know, you want your kids to be happy and healthy, but it also kind of validating in a way. And it's funny, like even later in life, uh, when we when we did my paranormal nightmare on the Travel Channel about the the story of the house growing up, all of a sudden my parents decided that they would talk and talk about the, the, some of the things that they experienced there, and it was just like made it all 
validated everything, you know, like they, they didn't, they didn't want us scared. They didn't want us to be worried about staying there, but they were experiencing some creepy stuff there as well. I mean, my mom saw a full uh, shadow figure in the basement when she was on the computer and, uh, you know, never, not, of course, never told us any of that, you know? Yeah. And that's kind of your parents trying to protect you. And some parents, you know, te- try to teach their kids out of the paranormal. And I think that's why we have so many people who are interested in the paranormal nowadays and the TV shows and stuff are so prevalent. Right. Because it scares parents and, and they tell their kids, oh, your imaginary friend is just imaginary when a lot of times maybe it's really not. That's right. I mean, I, I, b- I believe so, too. It's just like uh, it's like anything in life when you deprive somebody of something, they want to do it more, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's why there's so many paranormal investigators and all that stuff in the world. So, uh, how did you come? Because I, I've been fascinated with the Hinsdale House and the story of the Hinsdale House, and I always like to get down to, okay, well, what's legend and what what is fact? You know, what what can you prove and and, and things like that. And I know in the paranormal, it's hard to prove a lot of things, especially claims and things like that. But how did you come to own the Hinsdale House? Well, I mean, I, I had gone there uh, with my team. Uh, it was normally the the bookings were always done through me, and I was the responsible one of the group and. Uh, this, this particular investigation, the co-founder of the group booked it and said, don't do any research. I got everything. I'm going to brief you guys when I get there. And it was, you know, kind of like the, for me, it was like driving up to that, that TV, like those, you know, that commercial where the, the teenagers are outside and you see all the, like the chainsaws hanging from the garage and say, let's go, let's go <laughs> hang out in there. You know, um, it's yeah. kind of what it felt like to me, like from the moment that I started up that hill to go to that house. It was definitely, you could feel the energy, you could feel like a creep factor. And then when we got in the house, um, it was the middle of December and only electricity and heat in the one room. And there's flies buzzing around the house. It's cold as hell in there. Like, I'm like, why are there flies buzzing around? Um, And he had us sit there and watch the episode of A Haunting, uh, Dark Forest. And uh, I watched it and I looked at the co-founder of my group. I said, are you after Sydney? Are we in this house right now? The He's like, yeah, cool. I'm like, no, you know, like there's a failed exorcism here. That's something you kind of mentally want to um, bring yourself to before you jump, just walk into a location, you know. And uh, right. I uh, I grounded, you know, grounded myself, got mentally prepared and had an amazing investigation. Like unlike any other investigation that I've ever been on, it was like every piece of paranormal equipment that I brought was being used. And it was like they knew how to use it. The energies in the house wanted to speak, but they had no voice. And I just became, became like, not like the golem, you know, with, with the ring. But, I mean, I was, you know, generally um, excited about that location because of how active the energies were in there. It got to a point where it was just so bad. Uh, the guy that owned it that was in Calgary defaulted on the mortgage and had gone back to the bank. And they had started, like, getting it ready for demo. Uh, tore all the ductwork, all the electrical out. It was just a shell. And um, I don't know. Like, I, I, I reached out. Um, oh, I had a, an experience there. We were basically saying goodbye to the house. And I was in the kitchen. And there was no electricity, n- nothing like that. And, and I started researching the Misnick family that lived there, the last family to li- actually live there that had both passed away. And um, I had a, a personal experience, I feel like, with Flo Misnick. Uh, in the in the kitchen and, and walking upstairs into the bath uh, bedroom, I don't know. Like I just I knew from that point if I could save it, I was going to try, even though it needed a little bit of work. You know, I mean, it needed a new roof or black mold in there. I mean, it was uh, five hundred thousand honeybees in the wall. I mean, it, it needed quite a bit, you know, of work to being being done. I went and talked to the, the guy that owned it and went back to the, uh, Reese Tree Farms in Cattaraugus County, New York, and they were like two weeks away. And I had to come up with like 11 grand to put down on it to save it. And then I, at that point, even, you know, what, what a way to approach your wife, you know, honey, we got this income property down in the Southern tier, you know, like, uh, can I use the rest of what we have to, to buy it and have no plan for how to save it. <laughs> but, um, it was, uh, it was, uh, yeah, I mean, I just, she, she trusted me and the vision that I had and the hopes that I had, you know, and, and, uh, everything's come together. Sometimes you just take chances in life and they work out and, and the paranormal community really came together and helping me with the location and we were able to save it for sure. It's, it's a, it looks like a well-maintained farmhouse now. And if you look back to what it looks like, it was uh, it was not good. 
Yeah, I think that's awesome that you saved it from being demolished. And, and just because they, you know, may have tore that house down and sold the property and built other houses doesn't mean the other houses wouldn't have been haunted as well. Right. Yeah, because I feel like some of the energies at that location are from the land. You know, like you're you're definitely picking a lot up. The sometimes the it's more active on the outside than the inside. So yeah, so the the house kind of first came to become infamous in a book called Echoes of a Haunting, and uh, it was the the Dandy family that lived there with their children in the seventies, and the book kind of tells right. about their experiences in the house, and that's when it, the stories kind of came to light. So what what is the actual like history of the of the property and of the house itself? Well, I mean, you can you can I have the house dated back to 1853 uh, when it was first built. Um, I have maps to the 17 dating back to the 1700s. Um, I mean, there there's a lot of folklore, definitely stories that have been told from from time to time, and there's definitely uh, as far as like deaths that we can co- collaborate. I mean, we we have some of those as well. Um, we've also been able to collaborate on some of the stories that Clara wrote about in her book, you know, like the, with, with the research that's been going on there and the research that uh, teams have done. We've been able to pick up and get, get pictures of some things that they are claiming happened to them while they were there. You know, just, just being able to sit, sit with her. You know, I, I flew out. She lives in Florence, Oregon now, and she's an old woman, but to be able to sit there and hear the stories from her mouth, I mean, it's, it's, it was very takes your back a little bit you know the feeling she has for the location um but i mean there's folklore stories that i don't know if we'll ever be able to prove you know just because of the date of them you know right but there's definitely been deaths that have happened on or around the property that a lot of people associate with some of the energy that's there uh that we're picking up including members of the dandy family that have passed away um that 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 people pick up in the house all the time and we have a picture of uh i believe laura who committed ended up committing suicide after they left the house, but as a, as a young girl, right right by her room, and when I showed that to Clara, she said, "That's my daughter." I said, "Wow, you know, like it's why would she want to go back to this place that tormented her?" Right. You know? Um, but she said she knows why, and uh, when her son Mike had passed away in a car accident, and I, we all of a sudden started getting his name a lot. So it's. Pretty interesting, but the, the the house dates back to 1853. You know, the Everett's brothers, uh, they were iron uh, steel workers, you know, from Ireland, and one ended up moving to Iowa, one stayed on the property, and a lot of people associate them with these murders that happened. Uh, all folklore, I mean, there's no way of proving that these two people did this, uh, but supposedly that people would come through on the stagecoach trail, um, they would lure them in and then kill, rob, rape, steal, all their goods, and then bury their bodies out on the property behind the house. Uh, if it was the winter, they were storing them in the crawl space and in the basement. So, I mean, we've gotten EVPs to collaborate it, psychic mediums to, to, to collaborate some of that. But, you know, the story was told from a psychic that was there in the 1970s about this. You know, it's kind of just gone. You know, story's been told from time to time, you know. Yeah, and I heard you tell a story uh, on another podcast about a uh, bullet that you found lodged in a piece of wood. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Right. So, you know, we had part of the uh, restructuring of the house was we had to redo some of the beams that were uh, structural stability for the, for the right corner of the house. And uh, a lot of water had leaked uh, from the bathroom. And so I, I took the, some of the wood that was in still decent shape and I sent it to my friend, Jeff Fent in Columbus, Ohio, who uses that to make spirit boxes, you know, maybe some energy that's held in the wood will allow for us to get more information. I, I mean, I like the theory behind it, and the guy makes some beautiful stuff and, and is uh, does some really good good work. Um, and a couple weeks later, he called me. He's like, you're, you're never going to believe what I found in this wood. And he sent me a picture. I'm like, holy crap. Because, you know, there's sto- those, those folklore stories of people being killed and murdered, and this is this is a uh, a bullet lodged in wood from the basement, and you know we had to get it dated, and it was pre Revolutionary War, you know, so it was a uh, a bullet that ricocheted into a tree. The tree grew around the bullet, harvested it, and used to build the house, and it sat sat there since eighteen fifty three, you know. Wow. And then we ended up finding it. I mean, that would have been had I not known about you know Jeff and what he does, like. I, I may have just burned it or something, you know, like who knows, but to be able to have that, I mean, it's a good story and a good little piece of history. 
just to be able to put on display and show people. Yeah, and, and now every piece of wood that I would take out of the house, I'd be cutting in half <laughs> looking for things. I know. <laughs> it's it's true, and it's amazing. Like, the like people people want pieces of the, the house. Like, when we're remodeling and stuff, I, I didn't realize, realize how many people collect things from haunted locations. And that, that at times it's been a great fundraiser for the location just to give people a piece of siding or, or, or something like that from the original house definitely helped our, our efforts in fixing it up. So it's really interesting. We only have a few of these houses around the United States that have been around a long time and have this haunted history. You have places like, you know, and the horror house, which is privately owned now. They don't, they don't do paranormal investigations, but you have like the conjuring house and the Hinsdale house. And you kind of have this, uh, of both houses, you have this history of the families that live there that had all these experiences and to have those places still open for people to come in and, and either justify those experiences to themselves and have their own experiences with the spirits. Um, I think it's pretty awesome to have that living history and that connection to the past and to know, you know, to go in and, and say, okay, well, these families weren't full of it. You know, they actually, what they wrote in these books actually happened to them. Cause mm-hmm. there's some, I mean, there's some crazy claims around the dandy family, just like there is around the parent family with the conjuring house. Sure. So, uh, there's also, I, I hate that pop culture it's, we're kind of in the, the second part of the satanic panic from the eighties has kind of come back around, <laughs> but the house says the, the demon word has been thrown around with the house and there's actually been exorcisms performed there when the dandy family lived there. Right. Right. And so what do you, what do you think about the whole demonic thing and, and the fact that exorcisms were, were done on the house? Well, I mean, it was a structural exorcism, more like a cleansing. Um, you know, they called it an exorcism. But, I mean, there's definitely, you know, in all the time that I've owned it, there's definitely like a, a heavy hitting energy. You know, I've been involved with a couple of demonic cases in, in all the years that I've been doing this, and it doesn't compare to the Hinsdale house. You know, there, there's not, they're not alike as far as the, the cases go. There, there's definitely something there. There's definitely uh, a darker energy, I would say, but I don't think it's demonic. And I, and I warn all the teams that come there that it, it's there. I, I tried to suppress that energy as much as I could, uh, bringing a lot of positive and light to the property and to the energy, the positive energies that are there and, and try to suppress that energy, uh, from even acknowledging it. And it's been tough because that's what the house was known for back then. Everything was a demon back in the seventies. And that just has that distinction, distinction with it, you know, even to this day, it's like, I'm not going to correct people, you know, like if that's what you want to say. But I mean, you know, I, I, I don't that definitely don't think there's a demon in the house. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of people, cause I know some of the shows that I've seen about the Hensdale house, they've kind of focused on the flies. Yeah. Um, especially in the one, the one room upstairs. And, and that's kind of, that goes back in folklore to being like the demonic sign. So what, what is up with the flies in the house? So, I mean, we had uh, a lot of, they just, they just show up um, out of the blue. But I, I also look at like that room, uh, Mary's room, you know, that's where supposedly there's a portal. And that was also the room uh, in the floorboards where the, the honeybees were, 500,000 honeybees. I mean, are insects attracted to energy? Possibly. I mean, it's, it seems logical to me. And if there's some type of energy in that room, that's where they all go. That's where they were all going, you know, into that room and, uh, dying by the window or, or, uh, having a full fledged honey hive. And I mean, it was a, the honeycombs were like four foot into the floorboards. They'd been there for a long time. That was a big hive. So I've never slept in that room uh, in all the years that I've owned it. Other, other investigators have, you know, and I've had mixed stories about it, you know, I think just the energy feels different in there to me. You know, when you walk into the room, it's like walking through a threshold. Yeah. And uh, and they, they actually, uh, in the 70s, they just boarded that room up. They didn't even use it. So, so of course, owning it, you've spent the night in the house. Have you ever spent there in the night by yourself there? I have. I mean, I, I didn't get much sleep, but, you know, it's just like anything that you do. I mean, it's a, there's that, that creep factor, you know, especially being alone. You know, uh, you, you're hearing things and and. You know, it's just it's in the back of your mind the whole time. Um, you you try to get a little bit of sleep, and then something happens, and you wake right back up, and you're like, huh, it's not going to let me sleep. You know, it's, it's just hard to sleep. I think the only the only good sleep I've ever gotten there is in a tent outside the house, and I had a fan going in the tent with a radio on at the same time, 
blocking everything. So I, that's all I heard. Yeah. And I actually slept well that night. <laughs> so what, what experiences have you, have you had in the house uh, yourself? Because I'm sure you've, I mean, it's your house, so you can investigate anytime you want. I mean, I've had some pretty, pretty good ones. I mean, the first one that I had was, that, which really pushed me to buy the house was uh, when I was researching the Misnick family. Um, they were all talking about the exorcism. Nothing was happening, and I had a K2 meter in my hand. And mind you, there was no electricity in the house at the time. All the duct workers worked out, so there's no, you know, after doing our base readings, there's no logical explanation as to why we would get any type of energy reading in the house. Um, when I called out for flow, I felt like tingly sensation. I had goosebumps up my arm, and K2 meter went all the way to 500 milligauss, and uh, I continued to have what I felt like was a conversation with her. Um, I asked her to hold my hand as we went up the stairs, and the K2 meter stayed lit in my hand all the way up the stairs into the master bedroom. My friend Louie, who does a lot of photography, I asked him to go in and take pictures, and he caught what looked like ghostly legs on the stairs you know, which was really compelling to me. That was like the first, one of the main reasons I went to go purchase the house. Most recently, I was doing a, just a private investigation with my friend, Haley, who has never experienced anything paranormal. And um, it was like three in the morning. It was quiet. Nothing had happened. You know, she's trying to experience something and nothing's happening. And um, so we get a little siesta. I went on the couch. She was on a small one. And... Um, I felt something on the back of my neck, like a little brush on the back of my neck. You know, all the years I've been doing this, I don't usually say, oh, I was touched or I was scratched or it doesn't, it doesn't happen to me usually. It's happened like maybe one time and, uh, and I don't really make a big deal about it. And for, for this, it, it was weird because it felt like something lightly touched the back of my neck and I felt it. It, it was, it was really weird. And I turned around and the only thing that was on in the living room was a nightlight. And all of a sudden, I saw like this black darkness. It was like darker than dark, wide in front of the light, and it blocked out the light. And I was like, I just took one of those deep breaths and then held it. And I was like, oh, holy shit. <laughs> you know, like, holy yeah. crap, there is right in front of me. And I kicked over to Haley, and she turned around. She's like, oh my God, do you see that? I'm like, okay, I'm not seeing things. My eyes aren't blurry. She's seeing what I'm seeing. And she jumped over onto the couch, and it glided back and forth in front of that light quite a few times and then it dissipated into the one bedroom that was gone. So it's cool when I catch them on the camera, but when you're right there and you're actually seeing it with your own eyes, it's, it's a different feeling, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> whole different, whole different feeling. Yeah. Because and, and, and as much as you do this, you know, it's a little scary sometimes. I mean, that's what I'm looking for. I mean, you see it, you know, you get excited when other people are around, but when you're just uh, alone, you know, it's, it's, it's creepy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm the same way when I investigate, like if I'm, uh, in my own house, I have a, I have a resident ghost in my house and we, we have an understanding. And so he doesn't scare me, but yeah, if I'm by myself, it's a little more of that, like, okay, I'm going to pick up my pace and, you know, move a little faster. But if you're with people, right. yeah, I'm more, I'm the, I'm the type that's going to run toward it. Yeah, exactly. Trying to figure out what it is when I'm with people. But yeah, if I'm setting up equipment or something, and something happens, yeah, that fight or flight response kicks in and your legs almost have a mind of their own to get you out of there. It's exactly what happens. Totally. hundred percent. So a, uh, a few years ago you became part of the ghost finders crew. How did that, how did that come about? Well, I mean, it was a situation where they had reached out to film at the Hinsdale house and, uh, you know, I had kind of looked at what they did and, and, thought they would be a good fit to come in and tell us their story of their experiences and filming it. So I, I agreed to allow them to come film there. And they asked me to come and do an interview, which a lot of people do. And uh, so I, I was at an event in Erie, Pennsylvania, and I uh, jetted up there when they were there to do an interview. And, and I don't know, like from the from the get-go, I really got a good vibe, you know, like kind of like a family, kind of like a, not like being on a regular television set or, or doing it a show, filming a show. It was family and they really cared about what they were doing. I love the fact that they had a, a witch on the team, which you don't see a lot of, which brings different belief systems into paranormal investigating and, and, and different ways of maybe um, trying to open up those lines of communication that are, aren't natural to what other people do. So I thought that was very interesting and I, and I just love the professionalism behind the team and because of that, I decided that, okay, well, I'm going to help them out. 
I'm going to offer them some other locations and, you know, called up some favors from friends that owned other haunted locations and ended up getting them like four or five. And, uh, at one point they, Rob had gotten in contact with me and asked me to come down and be a special guest at one of the locations that I booked for him. And then they had asked if I'd be interested in joining the team. And I was, you know, at first I was like, I wasn't sure if I wanted to do that because I was kind of on a path of my own at that point. And it, you know, from going from a team atmosphere to being on your own, writing a book, going to Paracons and just having so much going on to commit to something like that is it's a big step, you know, but because it's all done independently, um, it was a little bit easier of a decision to make because it was, you know, they work around your schedule as opposed to saying we're filming from this date to this date and you have to, you know, leave your family and be on the road for this amount of time filming at all these locations. We, we have the freedom of being able to make our own production schedules and work it out as a team, uh, and, and film that way, which I really liked. So I decided to, to join them and, We've been filming ever since, you know, together, adding on some key components to the team and um, just uh, having a good time with it and really diving in at these locations. Yeah, yeah, I enjoy the show. Uh, what Y'all are in what, season nine now? Well, starting season 11. Season 11. We did, a, we did a, well, the season 10 we did, um, we just did some specials that we really, um, so our whole production budget, we would normally want to do 10 or 11 shows. Uh, so for season 10, I just, I talked to Rob and I'm like, why don't we just take the whole budget and really just like make these specials? Like these are going to be specials. They're going to be triple the amount of money that we put into a normal episode and really just look at the whole factor of how we're presenting this to, to our fans. And, you know, we looked at reenactments and, and how to really appeal and, and sell the story of, of where we're at, you know, instead of just, having that interview that's kind of like documentary style you can cut to things that make it more interesting as you're telling the story to help paint that picture so we really invested into the quality of the, of what we were doing and and storytelling uh, of the history just to make it a, more appealing in, in my opinion to people that are watching the show and we started off doing that at the Winchester Mystery House you know we put a nice budget nice amount of money behind that one and then continued with the next few episodes that we did yeah i really like the show and and what do y'all have coming up next with the ghost finders um we have two in production right now and then we are filming again in october in indiana at a location so we're going to have another one in the in the kennel ready to go so it's just a matter of how we're how we produce them and how uh how it, you know we will we'll look at them and make sure that, that they're all good to go before we release them to the public and then we usually try to make like a big deal out of the show and when we uh, release an episode. Yeah. So you have investigated all over the country. I know you're kind of partial to the Hinsdale house because cause it's yours. But what is, what's your favorite place that you ever investigated? Man, there's so many. Down in Virginia, there's this place called Henricus. It's like a camp that was really cool that we got some amazing things happening there. And it's actually an uh, episode of the Ghost Finders. Uh, that we filmed, uh, Pocahontas, one of the places where Pocahontas was, uh, her camp. Uh, so there's a lot of history behind it. Um, there's, there's a, a place in Iowa. Uh, I'm trying to think of the name of it. Um, my God, I just remember sleeping. It's like an old mansion on, right on the river. It was in D Dubuque, Iowa. Oh, I can't think of the name of it, but I just remember get, being woken up to the shutters flying open. Like there was a maid coming in the, in my room and just saying time to get up you know like it was <laughs> it was uh man i wish i could think of the name of it kelly's gonna kill me that, that book me there but <laughs> um yeah i mean it's uh there, there's so many my god i've been to so many different places winchester i would love to go back to i think that i i didn't have enough time there you know like we only had one night to film and it's so, such a big location the campus is huge and it's like a maze going through there. I don't know if you've ever been able to go there. I, I have not, but I've, I've seen pictures and, and seen documentaries on the place. Yeah, it looks looks really interesting. Yeah, another one was down in Alabama. The sloth furnaces, furnaces were amazing to go through and be able to investigate there. So many deaths have happened at those furnaces. And uh, you can just feel the energy when you're there walking through, you know, like where all the mishaps may have happened and 
my god, it was it was really cool. Um, yeah, there's man, jeez, that's, that's <laughs> like it's like I just enjoy every place I go. You know, like when, yeah. when whenever somebody says, you know, you, will you help do a public event or will you will you help do this? It's like oh my god, man, you're paying me to do this, right? And it's like wow. Uh, yeah. Of course, yeah. You know, it's like a, it's like a blessing to be able to, to be able to do that. I'm not any better than anybody else. I, I feel like it's just like what makes me special because I own a haunted house. Like, you know, I just I, I like to learn from everybody, even when I'm doing these public investigations or investigating a different location. It's like we all can learn from each other. There's no right or wrong. You know, there's nobody. Yeah, I mean, maybe I can speak a little bit better in front of a group, but <laughs> I mean, that's 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 about it. You know, like I, I just love doing it. And, and working with people yeah that's how i feel too and i and i love the history behind all of it and learning about these different locations and stuff and i love teaching other people when when doing events uh, part of one of my favorite things is is teaching people who have never been on an investigation or never been to an event and teaching them how to use the equipment and you know different theories behind the paranormal and things like that a lot of fun i absolutely love that too especially like younger kids yeah that are interested in it because you don't want them just breaking into locations and doing things the wrong way. Um, you know, like being able to like work with them, show them how things work. I, I've really always embraced the younger crowd too that ever reached out to me uh, and, and just watch them flourish because uh, they're the next generation and you want them doing things the right way. Yeah, yeah, and I like to I like to teach people like you know this is TV is entertainment um, and you and you kind of got to take it for what it is, but doing it for real, you know, always equate it to fishing. You know, you may catch something, you may not. You know, a, a TV shows at a location a lot of times for a week at a time just to catch one EVP. You know, so right. You know, if we're lucky, lucky to get a few pieces of equipment or uh, to react and things that happen while we're doing an event, you know, I, not people to feel special, but you know, be thankful that the spirit showed up while you were here. Absolutely. So yeah, anybody listening who's up in New York area, New England area, they can come visit you at the Hinsdale House. You can you can do bookings online for that. And they can find out more information about what you're up to at DanielClass.com and that's K L A E S. That's correct. Um but and they can find you on social media as also. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty easy to find. All right, Daniel, thank you so much for coming on and chatting today. I enjoyed our conversation. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right, everybody. Stay safe out there. We'll see you next time. Have a good day. Join us next time for a new episode of The Unseen Paranormal. Until then, head over to The Unseen Paranormal Lounge on Facebook for all the latest updates and discussions about the show. You can also find us on Instagram, Twitter, or at UnseenParanormalPodcast.com. And please rate, review, share, and subscribe to help more people discover the show. The Unseen Paranormal Podcast is proud to be the ambassador for paranormal for Verbal.com. A big thank you to my friend Chris Lips for the awesome theme music. You can find more of his music on Apple, Amazon, or Spotify. And as always, thank you for listening.